Hi, I'm Lito Lopena. When I introduce myself to others, I usually use the title Capability Consultant. It can sometimes be a bit tricky and difficult to try and describe that and almost always I find myself going back to the core of what it means. And basically, what I mean when I say I consult for capability is that I teach, I educate, I facilitate, and I instruct. So kind of similar to what all of you or what most of you watching this video now are doing. Now before we get any deeper into the content of this video, I am working with four assumptions that I think many of us as teachers, as educators, already went through or experienced. It's important that these experiences are called out because they will form the foundation or the basis by which we will identify our challenges and then eventually talk about how we can deal with each of them. So these assumptions are the following. Number one, you've attended an online class. Number two, you've migrated a face-to-face -face lesson to an online class. Number three, you've experimented with various online tools. So that means you've gotten past the migration, but now you're figuring out what's the best medium by which to deliver this. And you looked at many different kinds of software or platforms or applications. And finally, you've delivered an online class. Either it was successful or not, or you think that you need to work out some of the kinks, doesn't matter. So long as you've done a little bit of this, you're also part of the audience that we want to talk with. Let's now talk about some of the experiences we have out of each of these assumptions. Now these experiences are coming from my own personal experience. They also come from some colleagues who've also done some of the work around online learning. So let's start with attended an online class. An online class doesn't have the same dynamic feel as a face-to-face -face class. And sometimes what it does, instead of helping us learn, it does help us to sleep instead. Some of them can be complicated or too long or too tedious to work with because you need to navigate either a course outline or dialogue boxes. Because it's not as entertaining and not as engaging as we want them to be, we tend to have these kinds of experiences. Number two migrated a face-to-face -face lesson to online class. These are some of the experiences that we've gathered from many who've tried the same thing. They found it very difficult. The difficulty arises from the seeming impossibility of exercise or a part of a syllabus that you can, cannot convert because it really requires a social interaction. And now you ask, how do I do that in an online environment? In the face-to-face, -face, you just simply say, group yourselves but in a an online version you need to put layers now this is how we're going to group first so it's it's kind of more procedural and instead of simply saying the instruction it has to appear in certain lines or certain pages before it can be made to happen it's a resource hub because when you migrate of course it uses a lot of your internet a lot of your brain power also thinking about what, what's the best way to talk about this that you used to give in a face-to-face -face, but now it's going to be online. Very simply, there's a lot of work involved. Number three, you've experimented with various online tools. There really are about 174 and some of them are LMS, some of them are courseware. Teachable is one of the more popular. Also Moodle, Canvas, I think is being used in many organizations or many schools for that matter. There's also Kajabi, which also acts as a website of sorts. When you work with online tools, when you experiment, you find out that there's hardly any tool that can unite them all. So you have, maybe you use Facebook as your one-stop shop for school announcements, but then you go to another online tool to take the lessons. And then when it comes to reviewing, that's another online tool. So it can be complicated. Edmodo is one of the more popular tools that's being talked about or entertained right now in the public sector. And I think that's going to be the tool that public teachers will end up using. Nobi out of Singapore, also a very useful, useful tool. Podia, Google Classroom also is one. Zoom, we've all been made into Zoombies because of this platform. It can be expensive because it's a chain of many platforms. None of them give you a one, one, one solution. And you end up thinking, what's going to work with my students? And number four, you've delivered an online class. You've either attempted or you've actually delivered and your experience might range from the following. You found that it was difficult 
found out it was a nightmare that it's complicated because it's several windows that you need to manage or several pages that you need to manage it also can be expensive and also you feel a sense of incompleteness when you run an online class because you don't experience the same engagement that you do in a face-to-face -face. so you're looking for that you're looking for the sense of awe and right now in an online class you can hardly feel that because sometimes the student has their video turned off or the student is gazing outside or is hiding their cell phones or smartphones and they're actually chatting over at Facebook versus listening to you. If you've experienced any one of these, whether together, on their own, or a mix of sorts, the question we end up asking as educators is, how do we deal with this? So I'm going to give you five solutions. I made sure that they're practical and accessible, something that you can immediately apply to make and improve your online courses. So number one is stick to your objectives. Number two, mind your verbs. Number three, manage time. Number four, engage your students. And number five, get support. So let's start with sticking to objectives. An objective is actually the anchor of any learning event. In my experience, in this transition, many teachers suddenly become overwhelmed and focus more on the method that will bring about the objective. Now, don't get me wrong, it is important to think about the method, but the method is actually secondary to the objective. To describe this, let me give you an example. So let's say you're going to a certain place. So that place is your objective. You can end up having one method that will get you to that place. So in this example, it's a car. But we know that the car is not the only method that will help you get to your objective or the place that you want to go to. Walk could be another alternative. It's a longer, it's a longer process, but it'll still get you to your objective. A bus also can also do the trick. All of these methods, whether it's a bus, car, or a walk, Will get you to the place let me summarize what i mean by this concept if the intention is clear the mechanism will appear when you understand this lesson you now know that the true reference the true north is always the objective and never the method and i mention this because in the introduction of online we're introduced with many different ways by which to deliver a lesson we tend to be more focused on the method rather than on the objective. So that's a way to begin dealing with the confusion. Focus on the objective. So let's say, now we know the objective dictates the method. When it comes to online class, then you want to look for simply the right method that will deliver that objective. So here, Let's just replace the method box or the method circle with traditional method because that's where we're coming from. So let's say our traditional method is recitation or return demonstration or a team, team play. You're going to have them go into groups or a project. So those are your traditional methods attendant to the objective. When you shift to online learning, don't take your eyes off the objective. If the objective is clear, the mechanism will appear. So let the objective dictate the method. So number two tip on how to deal with the challenges is to mind your verbs. Let me give an example to illustrate what I mean here. Let's say I ask, what are the different online tools? And you answer, Articulate is one, Pinkific is one, Teachable is one, Moodle is another, Canvas is also another online tool. And what you're basically doing is recalling. And recall is a verb. But then let's say I change my question. Can you explain how you use some of these online tools? Notice I'm requiring something far higher than simply recalling. In recalling, it's easy because you just try to remember what was it that I mentioned. You try to go to the slides. But when it comes to explaining, you're now going to access a different part of your brain to be able to support your claim. So we now know that explain, it's a higher verb than recall. And then let's say I ask the question again to somebody else or maybe to you as well. Can you show me how to use an online tool? When you show and you're able to show, you're demonstrating a competence far higher than the person who was only able to explain it. So you now know that show is actually a higher verb compared to explain and compared to recall. And what we've created here is what I would term a hierarchy of verbs. We know recall is a low verb 
explain is a moderate verb and show is a higher verb. You can look up Bloom or Bloom's taxonomy. He's the one that's credited around creating this hierarchy of verbs. How do we use it in the context of online learning? Very simply, the higher the verb, the more methods required. So this ties up with the earlier lesson or the earlier tip we had, which was focus on the objective because the objectives will dictate the method. However, you want to mind the verb that you use for your objective. So let's say my objective is simply at the end of my online class, participants will be able to identify the parts of a computer. Identify is a low verb, so I will end up using just one method. For them to identify the parts, maybe my method will simply just show a computer and then show the different parts. So there are arrows pointing to certain parts. No explanation because it's simply just identify the parts of a computer. However, if my objective at the end of this online class, students will be able to explain the importance of certain parts of a computer. You now know that the method you use to achieve recall will not be the method that will be achieving explain because it's a higher verb and it requires a different method. A student cannot explain unless until they can recall. So one method on top of another method. And if your objective uses a far higher verb such as a student will demonstrate the use of the parts of a computer. Since showing is a high verb and they can't show unless they can explain and they cannot explain until they can recall, you know that it's a method on top of a method on top of a method. So very simply, the higher the verb, the more methods required. The important task is to understand the verb based on tip one, but then also understand the hierarchy of that verb. So mind your verbs. That's tip number two. Tip number three, manage that time. In a classroom, a student typically has about an hour or an hour and a half to understand a lesson. In an online class, the term that I use here is disembodied relations. They're there, but they're not there. You don't feel them. You don't have a kinesthetic or a sensational experience of your students. You just see them in terms of pictures. And, and that's okay if you're using a webinar, but if it's an online class, let's say you're using Google Classroom or you're using Edmodo, you have no way how the student is dealing with something that they're reading in terms of your lesson. You only experience them by way of the assignment that they submit, by the way they answer the quizzes and how they fared. So disembodied relations, right? You tend to want to look for a certain connection. So what's a way out of that? To manage disembodied relations, you chunk the hunk. In other words, don't prolong your agony of being disconnected with them. Just shorten your lessons. And you can time your lessons that after a quiz, they can rest and then they can do review another lesson. And it keeps them engaged because they get to feel a sensation that every now and then you're with them. Because it's not just construct this entire class and then dump it on them and then you wait once they react. So there's hardly going to be any personal experience there. If you shorten your class and deliver them in installments, let's say today class I'm going to give the quiz and then we're going to discuss them tomorrow. So that delays, that has a delay, but that also creates some sense of expectation, some sense of surprise. It kind of functions the same way when a, we're in, in Facebook, you're waiting for a post or you're waiting for a reaction and that gives you a lot of dopamine fluctuations. And so that's the same effect that you want to create out of your online classes to manage the disembodied relations or the feeling of difficulty that you're not connected, it's boring, it's not engaging, it's not interacting. So that's tip number three. Tip number four, while you chunk the hunk, just make sure also that you still engage your student. So three ways, make engagement your first choice. Number one, with your visuals. Make it really entertaining, make it really interesting that they'll want to dive deep into what you're showing. It says in many of the researches that attention span of students today, of kids generally, are shorter than a goldfish's attention span. And do you know how long a gold, you can get a goldfish's attention? 
seven seconds. And if a student just has less of that, then you really need to put a lot of elements in your slide that then keep them engaged. In my case, I use colors. Colors can have many different meanings and movements also have many different interpretations. It can trigger interpretations when you move one one image to this side versus another side. It can get them thinking. Make situations or create situations wherein they need to share something. In this video, you're allowed to ask questions or to post reactions and also interact. So these are ways by which to engage your students and hopefully it's already shortened but at the same time you engage them. Number five is get support. And you want to get support because the experience that you get out of online learning because it's new is attention assault. In a classroom setting, you're used to that environment. So when a student fidgets and another student stands up or raises their hand, you see all of that immediately. That's all automatic because you're used to the environment. In an online class, especially if you're doing it live for the first time, you're going to look at a different panel for chat, a different panel for annotations, you're going to look at the different screens of your different students and that's many different panels. It looks like a cockpit. It can be confusing especially if it's the first time and suddenly you're overwhelmed about the situation and you end up again saying the things that we showed earlier when you run an online class. It was uninspiring, I felt disconnected, I felt ignored. It takes a village to raise a child so you want to have a villager to guard a certain portion of your online class and we have three villagers number one eliminate number two simplify number three automate so that you are not assaulted and you are not asked of attention to look at one panel over another panel and take care of the student just eliminate those just tell them let's not use this the chat box let's just discuss live or simplify don't use all of the tools just use one tool so you're just paying attention to one panel if it can be helped that you need to use one or two tools automate or ask for help somebody else a co-host co maybe will look at the chats while you look at participants in the webinar and all of those come together when you begin doing your transition to online learning stick to your objectives mind your verbs manage the time engage your students, and get support. With just these five simple tips, you will have a better experience of online learning. It's less tedious because you've simplified it. There's less complication in trying to migrate because you're now focusing on the objective. Also, in terms of migration, it's far easier because now you know, because the verb is higher, I need to use more methods. In terms of online tool, now you know that you can automate or you can simplify or also you can shorten the time by which you engage them in an online tool and provide some variety in order to engage your students. And finally, in delivery, again, it's all of those things combined. And that's it. Hopefully, you learn a lot from this short talk and it inspires you to continue the work that you've been doing, the work that you've started, the work that you're already in the middle of, which is transitioning to online learning. I wish you success and well, no, I don't wish you. I want you to succeed. And hopefully these lessons that we shared today are going to be really helpful for you in making that work out. Do visit all of the other talks. In fact, some of them are complement to my talk and they will be also helpful to you as you journey into this new landscape. Thank you very much. Stay safe, guys. Uh, wash your hands and peace.